Hello there and welcome to the interview. Welcome to The Struggle. We are here talking to someone that you might have heard from before. We are talking to Justin Cross. He has been on your radio dial, possibly. He's been in many, many states, many radio stations, and he just happens to be an XJW, as you probably surmised at this point. Justin Cross, say hello, my friend. Well, good day to you, Mr. Eric. <laughs> good day to you, too. You know what? This is such an interesting and different interview, and I feel blessed and privileged to even be able to, to do these and to do this, to be able to talk to so many amazing, interesting people. And now here we are with somebody that has gone through the worst of it and come out the other side. And, you know, like me, I was disfellowshipped as an apostate in 2012. When were you disfellowshipped? Uh, it's going on about, I would say, three years now or so. Okay. So you escaped three years ago. And <laughs> you're someone that probably hit rock bottom when you got DF like a lot of us. Uh, you know, what happened? Well, yeah. Uh, as far as rock bottom, it's uh, a unique type of trauma that no one ever it's almost like they say in life where someone can try to become a parent but there's no real rule book on how to be a parent there's really no rule book on the final moment where you're you're leaving everybody behind you know because I actually was this fellowship and then I came back again and then I still wasn't able to make things work and you know I went through a simultaneous like divorce plus, you know, loss of all the friends and loss of all the family um, combo, you know, like it's like this nice little like nightmare cocktail of things that go wrong all at once. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a special type of rock bottom, man, because when you want to just call your mom or call like your, your boys that you, you grew up with or, you know, that go to person, you know, you're, 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 you're totally starting over and, and People, people don't think about all of the t different things that, that you're affected by when you when you really hit rock bottom with it. It's, whew, it's tough. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the marriage, um, you know, a lot of us that have spouses, when we wake up to tat, when we wake up to the truth about the truth, uh, our spouses do not come with us, unfortunately. Uh, like you said, your homeboys, your friends, your family members, they do not come with us. And so you're, I mean, some people work for JWs for crying out loud and then they lose their job too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a decade uh, long marriage to an amazing woman. She was like, I tell people she's absolutely, you know, just an amazing wife. And, you know, it's tragic that I couldn't make it work, you know, and I was far from perfect in any way, shape or form. But, you know, at the end of the day, man, it's, uh, it's just, it's just this big life experience that, that we all, we all have to go through on some level. It's true. It's true. And, and you know what, when you go through the experience and you come out the other side, you're forced to grow. You're forced to start standing on your own because before Watchtower corporate they dictate to you what you're supposed to think, what you're supposed to believe. You have to check with the elders. Can I go to jury duty? Can I, what, brother elder, can you, what should I do? You know, so now all of a sudden you're just cut loose, you know, like that great song, Free Falling. You're yeah. just free falling. Good song, good song, yeah. Oh, yeah, you just free falling, man. And it's, uh, it's a total psychological rebuild. Uh, process and uh, you know it, it does it takes it takes a long time to second guess yourself on on every level when you first start out because you don't have any frame of reference and you know I'll, I'll never forget like I, I know we'll we'll go into different types of areas of detail but I brought in a social media person that was trying to help me with with some some business stuff that I was doing and you'll you'll just laugh right away like I had to send out my first Facebook post this was like a year after I was this fellowship and I literally said to him out loud, I was just like, oh, that, that's going to stumble people. And, and I said it like organically and like really naturally and really empathetically, like from this very genuine place, like, oh, you, you have to understand that like you can't just post something that has that content because people will be offended. They'll be stumbled. 
and and I had like no ability to look in on in on the situation and understand how ridiculous I looked. And, and the social media guy looked at me like, "Dude, we're trying to get likes and hits, and people have people like this and be attracted to it. This is marketing. We're trying to like sell something." And it like blew my mind in that moment of just like how I was going to integrate into like society because it had to do too with like the holidays. It was like some play on on Halloween or something like that. And um, it was just, it's like, so it's so not just a psychological thing. It's, it's also like this whole integration to society itself that you just conceptually have to give yourself time to even like understand. All right. Just one uh, little story for you. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And you know, we all find ourselves using little phrases, you know, from, from the JW days, like, yeah. you know, like stumble, like in the truth. Like, uh, you, you know, whatever, all these little buzzwords that they use, that we used back in the day. And it's like you keep having to clean that stuff out. Now, when I have friends over that are XJ dubs, if anybody says in the truth or when I was in the truth, they have to take a shot. Bam. <laughs> That's a rule, man. It's a rule. Yeah, actually, uh, shout out to Andy Cibola, another like person that's. My buddy down in Austin, Texas, because he was the one who called me out on that, and I haven't, I haven't really slipped up on that. He's nice, this awesome, nice. awesome, awesome dude I kind of grew up with. Anyways, he, he took me in down in Austin, Texas. Love you, Andy, if you're listening. And uh, I said, yeah, man, when, I, you know, when we grew up in the truth, and he stopped me right there. He was like, oh, <laughs> like come on. Yeah, it's just kind of funny. But, you know, it's like, All right. You know, hey, yeah. I, I tell you what, Justin, I want to talk more about what you went through and some of your sure. background. But is it okay if I share a little bit from your bio from your website? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Let me pull that up. I got it on my phone right here. Give me a sec. All right. Now, if you go to justincross.com, you're going to see some cool music videos. You're going to have the opportunity to download some awesome music tracks. But I'm going to share some portions of this bio because I love this bio. It says, Sprung from the North. Refined in the South, singer-songwriter Justin C. Cross is equal parts classy and gangsta. His sound is best described as introspective indie rock. If Lana Del Rey eloped with Mike Snow and their firstborn child was raised in joint custody by Arcade Fire and Outcast, it would grow up to be J.C. You should have like a gang sign that's J.C., you know, like, <laughs> like you know, your fingers like get it, like make a J and a C and go, yeah, yeah. J.C. Work it out. We'll work that out. <laughs> All right. Now, OK, it gets better. It gets better because uh, I mentioned this to you earlier, Justin, that as I read this bio, I could pick out the little former J.W. clues that are huh. in this bio. All right. Those of you that are watching this, see if you can pick that out. <clears throat> All right. J.C. once lived by the rules society expected of him. He had the wife, house, and career. In the wake of divorce, spending nights sleeping on a cold piece of plywood strung across naked floor joists, Justin met eyes with a guitar he hadn't touched in nine years. He knew he wasn't fulfilling his purpose in life. He left a decade of lies with a comfy check for the uncertain future of his musical teenage dreams. After a multi-year hiatus of being banned from what he loved, Justin Cross picked up his guitar <clears throat> and began to write like a madman. He arrived. Oh, 
that like i mean you, you, i'm assuming you always played the guitar when you were a kid and you loved it and then all of a sudden you know you thought well i need to spend more time in field service is, is that what happened um well it's uh it's somewhat like that basically i started on bass guitar i was very inspired by fleet by the red hot chili peppers and i just wanted to to crank that out and my parents were really supportive of allowing me to have that outlet so they got me a bass guitar and i quickly was was very natural with the bass guitar, but I realized you couldn't write as much of a song. You couldn't create as much substance with a bass, and I couldn't express enough. I couldn't do enough dynamically. So I got a guitar, and the true story is that the first night I had the guitar, I wrote two songs. The first time I even played a guitar, I was at my house on Abbott Avenue in Lemister, Mass., and I came in and showed my, my family and my mom. And they're like, yeah, it's pretty cool, you, whatever, you know, like run along now, young man. You know, you, you, ha you have some, some, some upside there, but uh, run along now. So I kept working at the craft. And at some point in time, I saved a couple bucks and did a demo. And I coordinated with my dad to, to, to send out the demo. And at the time, I think what's really special is that my dad – hadn't even thought through as an elder the ramifications of, of kind of helping me send out this demo because he, he loved his son and he wanted to help. And so we sent that demo out and I got a call from a major record label executive within, it was, it was no more than like a week later. Um, wow. I hope he sees this because I, I'm forever changed my life because of a guy named Google him. His name is Andrew Gavazos. He's one of the Northeast premier promoters behind bands like Bare Naked Ladies and um, hope no one has stumbled. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Bare Naked Ladies, and uh, he worked with uh, Green Day and a couple other big bands. Anyways, so this guy's on the phone with me, and he's just like, look, how much did this demo cost? You know, where are you at in your, your career? What are you interested in? What are you guys doing? So at some point in time, the conversations heat up, and it's like, okay, wow, this is amazing. And then from that spurned this sort of beginning growth of like, this ongoing conversation that would take essentially years to manifest into which would you know we would get into later but long story short is 
the decision was made, like, I can't pursue a career in entertainment. As you know, the society pinpoints one particular industry that says, you know, hey, rock out, man, go be a plumber, go be an electrician, that's all good. In fact, do the Jesus thing, get, get, get your carpentry business on, you know, but do not be in the entertainment business. So long story short, I knew I had to put it aside, and I did. I, I literally just put down the guitar, and I was inflamed with passion. Ooh, man, I love sex. So I went and got me a wife, right? So that I wouldn't be, you know, doing it before marriage, you know? So it was a, you know, it was a good move. And, and I love this girl. And um, I put the guitar down, man. And it was literally like a decade later before other things, you know, that we get into later would happen with music. But literally it was like, yo, bro, they talked to the, the I, I, in fact, at, at my peak, check this out. I was selling out the upstairs of the Middle East in Boston, Massachusetts with like a hundred witnesses coming. And are you ready for this? I was regular pioneering. Woo! And my drummer was regular pioneering. Woo! And it was a trip. And everybody had a blast. It was amazing. It was awesome. And um, the elders, which uh, if my buddy Mike is listening to, he calls them the eggs, which is, doesn't even make any sense, but it's just funny. He's just calling them eggs. So he's like, the eggs rounded us up, and, and they rounded me up, and they were like, listen, homie, you can't be uh, doing this. This don't make sense. So they wrote a letter to the society, got some stuff together, and they basically said, look, you can carry the microphones. Actually, check that. You can't even carry the microphones if you're going to continue to be flaunting. Uh, they, 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 they quoted scriptures specifically about the... Come on, come on, those elders did a good job. What did they what did they teach me? The um the passions of the heart, the manifestations of the heart. What's the scripture about uh earthly demonic feelings of the heart or something like that? Yeah, like it's the one where it says that rock and roll music is from the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's that, that one? one? Yeah, it's the one it's something along the lines of like you know, look, Justin, you're, 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 you're giving, you're not giving attention to God. You're giving attention more to like the, the heart in your songs. You're, you're not, you're not calling on God for, for, for salvation. You're, you're wanting to whine about, you know, girls and, 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 and the struggle of, of life. And, and that's not in line with glorifying Jehovah God. So at that point in time, it was like, okay, I, I just put this down, you know, Lord knows I wasn't making any money at it. And so I was like, all right, let me go, let me, let me go get my career on. And, and I ended up pioneering and, and, and doing international, you know, work going all over. I've uh, been to Chile, Argentina, Peru, t uh, learning Spanish just so I could help out with the need is great, you know, in different lands and stuff. So, um, yeah, man, it's been a journey, brother. Woo! Yeah, amazing. So let me ask you this. Was it, you said 10 years ago, so it was around 2005 and you're a pioneer and you're playing in, in music already. You're already starting to get a following. It was that, it was around that time. Yeah, I was just a teenager, man. I was a teenager and I was rocking out, man. I was, I hit, you know, probably 10 different clubs in and around the Boston area. We sold out the art space in Manchester. Uh, one of our first shows, we sold it out. Um, and we were killing it. And, you know, the name of my band was Tag Team Trampoline. And that was a, that was like a household name. It was Triple Tag T. Team we like Trampoline. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's a trip, man, is I got a t-shirt. If we ever get back up, I want to get, I'm going to, I'm saving it for, for a while from now. I'm going to pop the t-shirt on and, 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 th and do some throwbacks. Cause I got a lot of friends that I know care that, that don't talk to me anymore cause they're witnesses, but they'll get a kick out of it. Cause it was a relevant band, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, you know what? This is a perfect place for me to jump back into justincross.com slash bio. All right, says he released a five-song EP in 2014, which received national airplay on 37 stations throughout the U.S. and 32 states. His song, Let Me In, peaked at number four in heavy rotation on San Antonio's top 100 record play, records played ahead of Jack White and Beck. He's already performed packed shows in Charlotte and created a buzz in Raleigh, performing at venues like the Poor House and Tierna Nog. His most noticeable live shows include headlining the SparkCon Music Festival in Raleigh, Hopscotch Music Festival headlined by St. Vincent and De La Soul. Oh, I've heard of them. He calls his fan base his new family Ooh. and cherishes their support. Oh, that's making me all just... just you want to just shed a little tear for, for Justin, poor little Justin. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I'll, 
I'll take you and I'll raise you one more. I actually am going to call them my fams, not my fans. How about that one? Fams, because I need my new family, man. I'm telling you, bro, I'm still hurting, man. Trust that. You know what? It takes time. It takes time. You know, a couple of years ago, I went to some training at my work. And it was there was a, a two hour thing on mental health put on by some psychiatrist, whatever. After it was over, I came up to him and I told him, I said, you know what? I got out of a cult recently and I'm, I'm I've got this activism going. I've got this YouTube channel, you know, da 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 da. I'm cleaning stuff out of my head. I'm, I'm working on my myself. And right. he commended me. But the first thing he said to me, he said, you know, it's only been a couple of years. He goes, don't, don't think that you have this licked. Wow. And that was good advice. Yes. It was good advice for me. Yes. That feels good just hearing, man. Thanks for passing that along to me. Yeah, that's, that's big, man. I mean, it's people just don't realize, like, even a lot of my quote unquote, as we would call them, worldly friends now, like, they have absolutely no idea, like, how much I still carry it with me and how rapidly, um, you know, separate from like traditional depression, which, you know, everybody that's either Jehovah's Witness or not a Jehovah's Witness, you know, at some point in time can, can, can have depression come into their life. But moments can get extra lonely even now when like you don't still feel plugged into your societal, you know, elements. So, yeah, man, I, I love the fact that, that you, you brought that up because that's something to just keep in mind is like, man, it's going to take years because we've, we were preaching this stuff on, on, on a significant level, you know, for decades, you know, so. Yeah, man. yeah, the end is near and all of that. But here's the thing. You have you have risen to a new level. You you're you're happy. You're thriving. You're successful. What are some of the things that helped you to go through this horrible process? Yeah, man, um, time definitely is a big deal. I think accepting the situation, giving yourself kind of time to just be like, okay, this this happened to me, and um, just kind of accepting that, letting it sink in. Definitely meditation was huge for me. I know, again, in the way that the witnesses view meditation, it's bordering on spiritism and blah, blah, blah. Look, at the end of the day, without going on a whole side rant about meditation, it's a way for you to breathe well and allow your mind to just like feel things. Like for example, a couple of producers that I just love, shout out to Decap and Brady out in New York City. They, they sat me down and taught me how to meditate. Now I cried immediately. It wasn't even 10 seconds into the fact that I was with two producers that I love and look up to and we were meditating before our session and it was non-religious and it was full of just love. It was unconditional love. I didn't have to judge them. They didn't have to judge me. Even now talking about it in this moment, the reason it makes me like sad and almost choked up is because it was one of the first big moments. I was all the way in New York City with worldly people, okay, after this fellowship, right? And, <laughs> and they, they, they were like totally accepting me. There, there was nothing in the room except for, hey, let's make music. This is going to be great. Hey, let's meditate before we do it. This is how we get down. And we meditated, and it, like, blew my mind, man. So um, so that's where I kind of, like, learned the importance of, of meditation. So that was big. And then I think, uh, how else did I get through it? Definitely reaching out to people. I, I'll be honest with you. One thing I just want to say out loud is I, there's no way I could even attempt to put in words how unbelievable people are like they're, they're so loving and they're so amazing when I would tell people just what I was going through and keep in mind I've never been angry with the witnesses I you never hear me anywhere talk out about the witnesses and, and I respect anyone else that has issues to the point where they need to say things against the witnesses in fact most of my disfellowship friends are, are either apostate and or have a lot of passionate negativity directed at the witnesses Look, I just don't have that. I understand they're just doing their thing on this planet, trying to figure it out like I am, okay? But what I'm saying is, is people were so incredibly nice. It was unbelievable. I would tell somebody what I'm going through. They would be like, come to this party this weekend. We can't imagine what you're going through. And I would go to the get-together, and I am like best friends with a lot of those people that, that, that liked my you know, post today on, on Facebook two and a half years later. 
I mean, just I've met amazing people that I can love unconditionally, man. So, so, so you ask me, how did I get through it? My answer is if you believe and you trust that these people that are out there are great, they're, they're amazing. There's really good people out there. So that's, that's just been my, and I, I'm just, I'm indebted to them. I, I don't know how they had time in their schedules to allow me in, but man, it, it's been amazing. So, oh, oh, and how could I forget? How could I forget the most important way to get through it? This is the most important way, bar none. Find your fucking passion in life, right? So what have you been doing when you're like messing around with service and studying and spending all this time, you know, doing this and this and this? If you're going to be disfellowshipped, if you're out, look, even if you're going back to the truth right now, this applies. Find your passion in life, whatever it is. Okay, for me, it was music, right? And lock into it and really experience it in a whole different way. And then also understand that there is such a risk if you don't find out what your passion is and pursue it. So you got to be locked in on that because I messed up most of my life because I didn't, I didn't have a way to express myself through arts and music. That's just part of what's in me and it's ingrained in me. So that, that's, the other, that's the final point is that you have to find what it is that you're passionate about. If you love skiing, if you love creating robotic inventions, I don't care what it is. Go nuts, man. So yeah, you had this traumatic religious experience and you feel like a social outcast and you're hurting and your heart feels sliced in little tiny shreds. Dude, go after your, your robot creation. Go after your passion, man. Start painting. Get out and do this. Hey, guess what? It's an opportunity right now to spend some time on what you absolutely love. So that's one thing that I can pass along. So hopefully that helps somebody. I love it. I love it. And you know what I also like, Justin, is the fact that your attitude, your positivity is one of the things that I'm seeing that carried you through. Your faith in in you know in humanity and people are good, you know. Yeah, yeah, we have been fed, you know, you know, and this is characteristic of most cults and most cult survivors is they find out that people are not as devilish as they've been told. People mm. are not as evil as they've been told. And yeah. and you start to get to know people like like in your experience, and all of a sudden people are inviting you over. People yeah. are opening doors for you. And mm -hmm. things are happening because you're going out after your passion. You're going out there with a positive attitude. You're applying yourself. And you're expressing your art. You're living your life through your art. And uh, I just... I just think it's I think it's awesome. I, I just I'm I'm loving this. In fact, I want to talk about JW stuff less. I don't want to talk about it more. <laughs> so, if I can ask you, when did the big break sort of come? How did that happen? I mean, your bio said 2014. All of a sudden, you're all over the radio and such. I mean, how did that happen? Uh, specifically, clarify which which your question. The, the question is, is, is you, you know, you get DF, you're reeling from that, you go back to your music, you're absorbed with your passion, and then all of a sudden, you're a successful musician, you're on the radio. I mean, how did, did you make contact with that producer again, or another one, or how, how did you get, how did you get, you know, famous, quote unquote? Oh, sure, yeah, so like, you know, with, with any good artistic craft, the fundamentals of it is you got to have a lot of, again, harness passion and care deeply about what it is that you do. So if we can be dramatic for a second, music is everything that I've got left. You see what I'm saying? That's my child. I mean, I, I want to joke around with my friends that post their baby pictures and stuff on Facebook, I got to like dress up my guitar in like a little baby outfit and be like, oh, look at my little cutie pie being so good in the corner. So that's all I had. So sometimes you put a gun to a man's head, it's amazing what he can do, okay? And I felt like a failure. I felt like a complete and total reject. When, when you see in the, the bio that I was literally like laying and sleeping on plywood floors, that was because my house was in shambles. Everything was just it was like the, the world had sent me a sign, like Jehovah really did reject you, bro. You know, you no good. You, you got to go, man. You know, like this is like pre-judgment day stuff. And trust me, I was thinking like, am, am I truly like, like, why am I that bad of a person? And of course, through the disfellowshipping process, it kind of reinforces that you're a bad person because you're like, like, you know, cast off, you know. 
And um, so when, when you say, uh, wait, I, I kind of lost my thought. What, what are we talking about? <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're talking about how you came through this, pursued yeah. your passion and got discovered, rediscovered, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. The good news was, is that, you know, through probably like, gosh, I, maybe 12, 13 years, I was in uh, uh, real estate and finance. And so I was able to understand how to interface with people. And, and again, the witnesses slash the society slash whatever you want to call it, one excellent thing, you talked about positivity earlier. The positivity that we glean from that religious experience is it made me into a nice person. I'm, you know, I, I'm so thankful even to be able to, I was on district conventions, you know, I was on, so I was able to speak in front of people. So, so, so let, let's be, let's be fair and let's give credit where credit is due. I credit a lot of my success with people to being trained to be a likable person. Okay, let me give you the biggest example. You, when you say, how, how have you been able to make it? One of the biggest things is what we get taught at there, which is like thinking about other people. So look at what you're doing. Something has motivated you to go into these people's lives and selflessly give them the opportunity to speak, right? And, 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 and show interest in somebody, right? So my personal relationships are off the chart. You know, when I, when I'm, when I'm even, when I, even when I approach a radio station, I'm like, Hey, you know, I really care about you guys. And I'm really thankful that you guys are like wanting to interface with me. And like, I need you. And you're like my new family. They're like, who is this dude? Like <laughs> after they like, wait a minute. And they realize that I'm real. And they're like, no, he's that nice. He's not kissing up. This dude is just like really thankful to be alive and so alive that so that's the answer to your question is really like when people meet me, they have a big experience. And there's one other thing. I had my appendix out when I was 16 and the operation was very advanced because I would have died if it was only eight years earlier because they had just invented the type of surgery that was needed when my appendix burst. What is the point of that story? Here's the answer. I realize you can die in 24 hours just like this for absolutely no reason when you're healthy. I have felt it, experienced it, and for all intents and purposes, there's no, no, there's no, there's still no medical reason why I lived through that process. So my reason is, is now you know that every day I wake up, I feel it. It's right here. I got a scar right here. So I know, I, I, I know like it can go just like this. So now my hope for the future is gone. I'm not going to be running around with this, with all this, like, you know, 35 kids and, 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 and in paradise with little lions in my lap, you know what I'm saying? And like little snakes crawling around me. Cause we're all just partying in this paradise scene, whatever. So now it's like, what you going to do, homie, what you going to do with your life? And it's like, I'm gonna rock the hell out. So here I go, bam to the moon. And so I wake up every day, like, I'm not going to waste one second. I'm going to get after it. And so here I go, here, here I come. And I got love to show to other people. I got a mission, man. You ain't going to take my 30 you know, plus years from me and, 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 and make that all for nothing where I'm sitting there talking about what you really need to do is learn more about Jesus, who is the son of God and, and, and blah, 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 blah. You can't take all that from me and then tell me that I have nothing left to give this world. I'm going to make a difference and help people. And so that's it, man. So the best answer I can give you is that everything I just told you is unique to me and it's real and it's in the music and it's in what I believe in. So if that has true relevance, if that is worthwhile for the universe to accept, I am challenging the universe to accept it. And I am pushing 110% and, and let the universe do what it will. But it's honesty, and that's all I can give. So, so that's the best answer I can give you because art is subjective, man. My next album could be this, it could be that. But everybody's responding to it, and it, it's, it's, it's a wild ride right at the moment, man. Like I, like I said yesterday... Uh, Pandora. I'm on Pandora now. So it's like I got my own station on there. So if somebody goes on Pandora, just types it in, boom, I'm in there with some of my favorite bands. So, I mean, it's crazy, man. It's wild right now. Exciting stuff. Oh, the 